Okay, folks, we'll get started. Um, I'm sure you've all looked at the schedule and are aware that we've now finished with the immunology and we're starting on the bacteriology. Um, as regards infectious diseases in people, the, by far the bulk of the infections are caused by viruses and bacteria. Fungi are really rather more important just as regards immunosuppressed patients and opportunistic situations. And parasitology or parasites is also um, a minimal number of cases compared to what we see as regards infections with bacteria and viruses. So bacteria, bacteriology are one of the two biggies as it comes to regards to human infectious disease. The logic of what we're doing is we're assuming that you know your immunology. There's not, we're not going to go into a lot of complex immunology in the bacteriology section, but we're also not going to repeat it. So the assumption is that you know your immunology. Um, basically, we, the bacteriology section is broken up into two sections, which are really referred to as basic and clinical. And by basic, it doesn't mean basic, it means fundamentals. It means that we're going to, in the first five lectures, what we're going to do is we're going to cover the generality of bacteriology, of, of, ba of what bacteria are and, and how we know what they are, how we define them, what sorts of things they do. And in particular, this is going to then focus on a on an intermediate lecture on bacterial pathogenesis, which will be lecture number six, which is, which, begin, which is the sort of pivotal lecture in between the basic and clinical bacteriology, which overviews infectious diseases, the sorts of things that we see and how we really look at things. And then by the time we get to the clinical part of the course, where we're looking at individual bacterial species, the assumption is we know our immunology from the previous part of the course. We know and understand the generality of bacteriology and therefore we're not going to have to redo it every time we have a lecture on each individual species or genus or the diseases they cause. So the bottom line is you need to know thoroughly these first um, half a dozen lectures when you look at each of the other lectures later in the course. It'll make it a lot easier for you, trust me. And if you don't trust me, I'm sure that's the case. Okay, all right, so we're going to start today with the bacterial cell. And... Um, and by the way, I'm Dr. Alvin Fox. Uh, I'm a full professor in the microbiology, immunology department. And I've been here for 26 years now, so I've done this for a while. Okay, so let's keep rolling here. Okay, key words. Uh, I will, in each of my lectures, there will be a list of key words. And that doesn't mean that it's the only thing you need to know, but at least it focuses on the things that we're going to be covering. We're going to be talking about uh, what bacteria and how they're different from other cellular forms of life. We're going to talk about a couple of different classes of different, uh, different, excuse me, different kingdoms of bacteria. We're going to talk about all the components of bacteria in a general sort of way, and we're going to get more specific, particularly the cell wall, in another lecture later on. So we will cover some things in this lecture and the next lecture that may seem a bit general, but you're going to get more details in the cell wall lecture. And you'll see why we focus on the cell wall very, very soon. We're going to talk about how we differentiate bacteria in a general sort of way. Um, all the components, let's say, of bacteria and many of the things that they do. And then we're going to talk about some of the outside components of bacterial cells that really aren't part of the cells proper and some of the unique forms of bacteria, particularly spores. Okay, so to begin. Um, Bacteria are referred to as prokaryotes, or prokaryotic is the adjective, in contrast to eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are often referred to, referred to as being simple, and that is, in my opinion, blatantly untrue. They are simple in terms of the fact that they have less genetic information, and they are simple in terms of the fact that their insides of the cell are, are, um, do not have membranous structures. We'll get into that a little more shortly. But as regards their external layers, for a variety of reasons, they're actually a lot more complicated than we see in many eukaryotes, certainly human beings. So um, I wouldn't refer to them as simple. I'd say that they're, let's say they're different. Um, basically, prokaryotes are broken down into two kingdoms. And you, archaea is a term that we'll use for the next couple of few minutes, couple of minutes, and then we'll probably disband it never use the word again, it has nothing to do with it. Because archaea, are, there are two, actually two kingdoms within the, among the um, prokaryotes. 
And bacteria is used as a sort of a generic sort of way. To, we're, going to, we're going to be talking about using that word, of course, a lot in a bacteriology course. But it also refers to one of the kingdoms of among the prokaryotic, among the um, prokaryotes. And these are biochemically and genetically quite distinct from the archaea. So, um, that's oftentimes in more advanced courses, people talk about the three kingdoms, which they sometimes in high school don't, or in undergraduate courses for that matter. We don't look at things like zoologists or botanists look at things. We look at things as three kingdoms. The eukaryotic kingdom, which is you and the rest of the life on this planet, other than, bacteria, other than prokaryotes, which includes two groups of um, single-celled organisms, the bacteria and the archaea. So, again, the prokaryotes or bacteria, sometimes just use that word bacteria. This word bacteria gets a bit misused in all sorts of places. The big deal, again, is that prokaryotes consist of two kingdoms, and one of them are the, are the true bacteria. The true bacteria are also referred to as eubacter, which is probably another term we'll never use again in this call, so you may never reuse in the rest of your lives as physicians again, but we need to sort it out now and get it over and done with. Okay, so the eubacter are the true bacteria. They are human pathogens. They can be found in, the, in, in clinical samples or in the environment, and they're one kingdom. Now, the point, the big deal is here is that these are found in the environment. That many, many, many bacteria in the environment are true bacteria. The archaea, archaea are also environmental organisms, and I said again, make up the second kingdom. But they don't cause human disease. I don't believe there's ever been a clear case single case of archaea causing human disease. And that's why we will, once, we, once we understand the aspects of what these things are, why we'll not be talking about the archaea again, because they, they, except from the point of view of knowing how they're different from eubacteria or true bacteria, um, we don't have much of any reason to really cover them beyond that in, in a medically oriented course. And again, eukaryotes, or eukaryotic is the adjective, are other cell-based life. For example, plants, animal or fungi would all be eukaryotic. And it's not an issue of being single-celled. For example, um, amoeba are single-celled, but they are eukaryotic. Fungi can be single-celled, and they are also uh, eukaryotic. The issue is, is the structure and organisation of the cell from a, from a molecular and biochemical characteristic, which we're going to get to in the next few slides. Okay, so let's begin defining the differences between prokaryotic cells versus eukaryotic cells. First of all, um, they are not compartmentalised. And what that means is that you've all studied things like mitochondria, uh, rough, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, um, and other membranous structures, the nuclear membrane, other membranous structures in eukaryotic cells. Now, other than the cell membrane, there are no, membra there are no um, internal compartments in bacteria. They have to have a cell membrane. That's what makes a cell a cell by definition. So if a cell regards a cell membrane or a plasma membrane or any of the other terms that you may have heard in the past, which can be equally well used again in the future, uh, they apply. There has to be a cell membrane. But beyond the cell membrane, there, there, there is no compartmentalization in the eukaryotic cell. And I have, you'll notice the word is prokaryotic here. I'm not talking about differences between archaea and eubacter here, the two subgroups or kingdoms within the prokaryotes. I'm talking about the general thing about prokaryotes at the moment. The cell membrane usually lacks sterols, e.g. cholesterol, which is common in higher, the membranes of higher cells. Now, coming back to the simplicity aspect, they do only have a singular circular chromosome. There could be multiple copies in some instances, but the actual genetic information is coded on one chromosome. And that does not, like, I don't know what it is in human beings, I can't remember, but over 40, whatever it is, there's just one chromosome. Now, anything you're going to find in a higher cell, and I'm not going to repeat all that in this lecture, anything that you've found in a higher cell, you're going to find in bacteria. They just may be a little bit different. And we exploit those differences in many ways. For example, in selecting antibiotics which will kill bacteria that won't kill or, even, or harm, hopefully, human beings. 
So we, it's very important that we understand these unique, not just the features of bacteria, but the unique fact features, the things that make them unique, because we exploit these features. And one of these places that we particularly exploit are the ribosomes. Not only do we exploit the ribosomes in terms of their ability to be used, um, one of the sites for antibiotic, antibiotic activity that Dr. Mayer will cover later, but in addition, the actual subunits and the, um, and the RNA that's found within these protein subunits are different in bacteria. S refers to a Spedberg unit. And by the way, um, I should make it clear, you really don't have to take notes here unless you, because the, the, the handout has got more detail than the, the PowerPoint presentation. And what I really want you to do, you, you are responsible for both, by the way. But the idea is, is that the PowerPoint presentation will give you the big picture, the overview, most of what's in the handout actually. But then any fine points that don't require a lot of deep thought beyond what's in the PowerPoint present will be there so that you can learn those facts. So you, if you want to take notes, it's a free country, do whatever you want to do, but it, it isn't necessary. Okay? What is important though is that I think we help you just listen and take this in. Okay, uh, so the ribosomes are 70 S, S referring to the term Spedberg unit, which is in, which is in the handout. And uh, it's, it's simply a measure of size. The, uh, the two subunits of the ribosomes are a 30 S in size and 50 S in size. And they are both, in both instances, smaller than they are in eukaryotes. So if you see a ribosome and it says 40 S or 60 S, you'll know immediately not the fact you've necessarily memorised that it's 40 and 60 S, but by the fact that it's not 30 or 50 S, you'll know that it has to, can't be bacterial, you'll know that it's eukaryotic. Similarly, the, the, the uh, subunits of the RNA that's found within these structures um, is also different in, uh, in, in uh, size than is found in higher cells. For example, again, they're smaller. The 16S is 18S in higher cells, and the 23S, for example, is often 28S in size. So everything is smaller, but there's a lot of similarity. There has to be a lot of similarity because, as we all know from what you've had in the past, ribosomes are involved in protein synthesis. So, and again, everything that goes on inside a higher cell has to go on in a bacterial cell. And by definition, much of the early information that we had on the biochemistry of life was actually obtained with bacteria. So there's going to be a lot of similarity in these sequences. But the point is, is that there are differences in the 16S RNA sequence um, among uh, many bacteria. Closely related species can have very similar 16 RNA sequence. But this, for example, is one of the standard things that's used, as we'll discuss in the next lecture, in bacterial classification, in coming up with probes or molecular approaches to rapidly identify microorganisms in the uh, clinical laboratory. Okay, so that's good to know that these things are variable among the bacterial kingdom, but also that they're, they're different, certainly by size, than found in, in higher cells. Okay, now we'll get to, I think, one of the... Yeah, that's one of the last two... Now, keep saying we're going to get away from the archaea. We will get away from them eventually. Certainly after this lecture, you won't ever hear archaea again. Not that they're unimportant. I think they're very, they're very interesting in, in organisms. Uh, some people have made their whole lives work on them, even got Nobel Prizes, but uh, with regards to this course, they're not very important. So bacteria versus archaebacteria, another term for archaea. Okay, new bacteria or true bacteria, or later on we'll just call them bacteria, have a peptidoglycan or cell wall layer which is outside the cell membrane, sometimes referred to as murine, particularly characterised by a good friend of mine, the sugar muramic acid, which is used as a marker for, 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 for not only telling you that you've got bacteria in a sample, but you can actually use it to measure the total bacterial bioload in clinical and environmental samples. It's a, basically, it's a thing that's only found in bacterial peptidoglycan. And so it's, very, it's a very interesting, very important molecule in that sense. For example, the archaebacteria have what's referred to as a pseudomurine. And in this purposes of this course, I'm not asking you to learn the structure of the pseudomurine um, versus the peptidoglycan, just to simply know that it is similar but different. And one major difference is the fact there is no muramic acid within the pseudomurine or the cell wall of archaebacteria. And similarly, although of course there has to be similarities, there are conserved and variable regions, DNA sequence regions within 
um, most molecules, but within 16S RNA, there have to be some parts of the molecule that are, that are similar across the kingdoms and across the three kingdoms, because otherwise, how could they do what they're supposed to do in protein biosynthesis? But the sequence, there are variable regions, the sequences are different enough between different species that you can often differentiate bacterial species just by saying what sort of 16S RNA is there. You could tell whether it's a streptococcus or a staphylococcus or what have you, just by not having information on the 16S RNA sequence. And this just shows you diagrammatically what we've been talking about already with the eukaryotic versus the prokaryotic cell. They're thumbnail sketches, but they're designed for a particular purpose. First of all, if you look on the outside here, you'll see this single line. That's the cell membrane in mammalian cells. Now, we're not going to get into uh, most other eukaryotic cells in this course. You will hear some stuff about um, fungi later on. But as regards most mammalian cells in plants and animals, they only have a membrane. They don't have a cell wall or cell envelope. Bacteria, this is why in this instance, outside the blue layer, we see a couple of extra layers, or actually three extra layers here and two extra layers here. So again, if these things are so simple, how come there's actually a bunch of extra layers that are actually present in the, um, in the, in the prokaryotic cell? So there are additional things we need to know. Now, the simplicity does come in when you look inside the cell. If you look in a eukaryotic cell, you'll see that we've got um, uh, mitochondria, we've got a nuclear membrane around the DNA, the chromosome. We'll see here the rough endoplasmic reticulum, these little blue blobs are the ribosomes that are sitting on them. If we go to bacteria, now we don't, there's no nuclear membrane, there's no mitochondria, there's no rough endoplasmic reticulum, or for that matter, no smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The, the ribosomes are free. Now, you could get the impression from looking at these two things and say, well, you know, how these bacteria must be able, be, not be able to do anything that eukaryotic cells can do because they don't have the things that they need. And of course, that's absolute rubbish. Everything, everything pretty well that goes on inside a higher cell goes on inside a bacterial cell. Biochemically, the two, the two things are very, very similar. For example, yes, they don't have mitochondria, but they do carry out the same processes that carry out, go on in mitochondria uh, at the surface of the, the cell membrane. Yes, they don't have a rough endoplasmic reticulum, but the only part of the rough endoplasmic reticulum that's needed for protein biosynthesis is the ribosome. So yes, they do carry out protein biosynthesis. Now, it's beyond the scope of this course, and there are sort of the post things involved in post-translational modification that go on in the endoplasmic reticulum, which don't go on in bacteria. For example, we very rarely see glycoproteins in bacteria. But again, I said that's beyond the scope of this course. But the issue is, is that everything that goes on here has to go on here pretty well, the major processes, in one form or another. So that's the way I would look at it. And don't worry about this. Um, the issue is how simple that is versus, I mean, how complicated that is versus that. The, the same things are going on biochemically. Um, okay, so we have mentioned, let, before we go on, let's talk about the major things we find in a bacterial cell. So we're going to forget about these boring old things, eukaryotic cells, and we're going to talk about prokaryotic cells now, or ba bacteria. And now I've dropped the word, and I try not to say it again, the word, uh, the word archaebacteria, that's gone now. Because now we're going, now we're going into a situation of... Um, you know, of the medical part of this course. All right, so we see a cell membrane. It has to be a cell membrane, no debate. We've already discussed that. We see, uh, in the case of gram-negative bacteria, we see a cell wall layer or peptidoglycan layer. And it is purposely, everything's drawn here very simply with a single line because I have a whole lecture on the cell envelope for lecture four. So I wouldn't want any of you to feel unsatisfied that you're not getting enough stuff to memorize. <laughs> it will come, promise. No, seriously. Um, no, we're going to get into more detail later. But that's the reason that this stage, these things are just drawn as a single line. Okay? Now, in the case of gram positive bacteria, you'll see there's actually an extra line. Because there's actually, I'm sorry, that's the gram positive, excuse me. In gram positive bacteria, you'll see that there's only uh, two lines, but you'll see in gram negatives, you'll see there's three lines. And that's because there's an outer membrane in gram negative bacteria, which we don't find in gram positive bacteria. You'll also notice that this line, is, this purple line, is thicker here than it is in the, uh, in the purple line here. And that's because the cell wall is thicker in gram-positive bacteria generally than gram-negative bacteria. 
you'll note again, there's no nuclear membrane. There's no membra- membranes to get in the way. Things go faster in bacteria. The replication rate is faster in bacteria because things aren't held back and controlled by the nuclear membrane. Um, the capsule is present here. And this is really not an cell envelope layer. These three are purposely drawn very close together. These are the true cell envelope layer. The cell membrane, the uh, peptoglycan layer, and the outer membrane if it's present. The capsule is something, if you grow bacteria in the laboratory, they oftentimes will not produce a capsule. Well, the capsule may be different when, it's, when, the, when, the, uh, when there's an infection going on. The capsules are needed in certain situations. They're very uh, important in the environment, for example, in protecting bacteria from noxious things. But the capsule is not considered a true part of the cell envelope. It's an appendage. It's something that's outside. The flagella are extending from the cell membrane. Not all bacteria have flagella. And this, I often refer to this lecture as the prototype bacterial cell. I think I changed the name a few years ago. But anyway, the point I'm giving you is the generality. Most bacteria... Um, there's a lot of variability in, in whether the single flagella, multiple flagella, or any flagella at all. And I won't make a big deal about this in, course, in this course of which ones do, except for the fact that you know that bacteria can have flagella or locomotory organelles. The granules are given as red spheres here because they're often different in bacteria than they are in higher cells. There are things like polyhydroxybutyrate and uh, polyphosphate are granules which are produced by bacteria, certain bacteria. Again, not all bacteria make these storage granules or these particular types of storage granules, but they're not made by mammalian cells, and that's why there's no red dots over here. Okay, I think I've covered everything. And the term nucleoid is often used to describe the, the nucleus in bacteria because it's nucleus-like, but it doesn't have a membrane. So that's why it's, nucleo- it's, it's a nucleoid rather than a nucleus. Okay, I think we've covered all this now. Okay, so we will, um, again, we will get into the, as I say, there's not, there's not an awful lot biochemically to say about the, the inside, so we will spend more time later on than the, on the outside of these cells. Um, I should also mention plasmids, and these are extra chromosomal uh, copies of DNA. They're different than what we see in chromosomes. They can be a multiple copy number, and they're particularly important encoding for pathogenesis factors like, uh, for example, the plasmids in, uh, in anthrax, PXO1 and PXO2, are both plasmids. And without these plasmids, the organism does not cause human disease. The plasmids are very important in pathogenesis if they're present. Not all bacteria have plasmids. We'll talk about the, the cases where they're very important as we go through this course. But not all bacteria have important plasmids, so we won't talk about a lot of cases. We won't talk about them. They can also code for antibiotic resistance factors and that's why it's so easy to spread things for antibiotic resistance between organisms and sometimes even between species uh, because these plasmids are easily spread from one organism to another. And they're also involved in bacterial replication. And Dr. Mayer has a genetics section uh, in which he's going to cover, um, uh, among other things, plasmids and bacterial replication. So you'll get more about that too. Here I'm going to just talk very briefly about the grand stain and I will get into it in our next lecture today in detail. But I really want you to get at this point what is a grand stain and why do we care about it in the generality of bacteria. The grand stain is the most commonly used bacterial stain. Bacteria will stain either gram positive, that's why this is purple. Usually, not always, but usually there's a reason for things being certain colours or certain shapes in this as we go through these slides. You may not see it in some cases, but usually I've got a reason for it. These are purple or blue in colour when they're stained with the gram stain, and gram-negative bacteria usually stain pink, or sometimes it was red. But anyway, we all know the difference between purple and blue versus pink and red. Okay, so basically what this does is it breaks the bacterial, the uh, eubacteria, or true bacteria, into two groups, and we get a lot of other information that we'll talk about in the next lecture beyond whether they're gram-positive or gram-negative. And it's not a 100% correlation, but the issue is, is, that, is that the gram-positive staining characteristic reflects the cell envelope. So if you know that an organism is gram-positive when you get into the clinical part of this course and you know what gram-positive means when you've got from the pre- what I've done up to this point and what you're going to get in lecture four on the cell envelope, 
you don't have to learn again and again and again the features that you can expect to see in an organism. And it's one thing that you really need to get is gram positive and gram negative and what it means, not just the gram stain, but what it means in terms of the biochemistry and the pathogenesis factors that relate to being gram positive or gram negative. So it's your call. Each lecture, when we get to the clinical part, learn it one at a time, learn, go into Murray, it will go in nauseous detail, every organism will repeat itself over and over and over again. You can do it that way, or you can do it the Fox way, which I think is a bit better, which is learn what a gram positive and gram negative organism is, and understand what it means in terms of pathogenesis and biochemistry, and then when you go through the individual organisms and the diseases they cause, you'll have a framework and it will help you and make it easier for you. Again, it's a free world, your call. Okay, um, all right, now, let's, let's start, now we're talking about the simplicity of, um, of um, bacteria. Again, as I've already mentioned, bacteria do carry out oxidative phosphorylation, which is involved in the, with the Krebs cycle and energy storage of ATP and what have you. Uh, we will be having a whole lecture on um, metab bacterial metabolism and we'll get more into oxidative phosphorylation later. But the issue is, is just be, again, just because bacteria don't have mitochondria, they certainly carry out oxidative phosphorylation. They do have a Krebs cycle. And indeed, much of the early information that was generated about this came from bacteria in the first place. Now, the cell wall is outside of the cell membrane. And what you shouldn't do is confuse a membrane and a wall. And some people do the rest of their lives. That's the wall. It's solid. It's hard, it's rigid. Okay? A membrane, by definition, is fluid, made up of phospholipids, and it moves. And that's why, for example, in this slide here, again, that was purposely shown as being sort of this vague, sort of amorphous sort of shape. But if you look at how we've drawn the bacteria, it's very rigid, it's very sort of a special shape, it's very laid out, the shape. Because membranes are fluid and they change in shape. There's nothing holding them in place. But walls, on the other hand, are very solid. That doesn't mean they're like, they're not, that things can't pass through them. They're not, these are molecules. These are huge molecules and they have gaps in them. So certain things can get through these walls, but they're rigid and they're solid. And indeed, if you, for example, heat bacteria to about 170 degrees centigrade in formamide, which is pretty nasty, and you look, at this, look under the microscope, electron microscope afterwards, you'll see that the cell wall has actually got the same shape as the original bacterial cell. This thing is very tough and very strong. And in particular, because it's rigid, it protects the cells from osmotic lysis. The cell has got, a, because of all the salts and what have you in there, it's got a high osmotic pressure. And what would happen in, in, in uh, the case of a prokaryotic cell floating around in the environment, if there was no cell wall that was there, then the uh, cell would burst. Now, things are a bit different inside the human body because things are controlled. Things, you know, there's a particular, um, it's, things are very um, controlled in terms of osmotic pressure and salt concentration and what have you. But things can vary a lot when bacteria events, for example, being transmitted through the air as they would be in tuberculosis, which is air, an airborne infection, or uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, another example of an airborne organism. So they've got to be able to do okay in the environment when they're passing between people, or in some cases when they're actually residing in the environment, staying dormant for a long time. Okay, so the cell wall protects from osmotic lysis. You know the differences between a wall and a membrane. Okay? And we will go into more detail in this, uh, as I say, later on. Okay, this slide here is the one that's going to show up again. Okay, and it will seem to you here that I'm whizzing through this and not saying an awful lot. Yes, I am whizzing through it and not saying an awful lot. I'm going to get into this in lecture four in more detail. Okay, but what I want to do is just give you a brief overview here. Okay, these are gram-positive bacteria and these are gram-negative bacteria. You'll notice with the gram-positive, there's already this very thick peptidoglycan or cell wall layer. There are other things attached, which I'm not going to talk about today because I'm going to define them in great detail later on and what they do. But let's just mainly look at the, the... And if you look at this, again, this is the typical way that one draws a membrane, these being phospholipids and these being proteins. You'll see that this, there is a membrane, of course, a cytoplasmic membrane, a cell membrane, a plasma membrane. Any of these words might show up, whatever you want to call it. But these, this, is, this membrane will be there in all bacteria. But this wall, this solid thing is sitting on top of it. 
In the case of gram-negative bacteria, they usually have a thin cell wall. Of course, they have a membrane and of course, they have a cytoplasm. Okay? And there are various things which I'm not getting into now which are unique to gram-negative and unique to gram-positive bacteria. So we'll get into that later. So just get to this stage that these things are different. Gram-positives and gram-negatives are very different biochemically in terms of their cell wall, in terms of what they do inside their cells, in terms of metabolism and what have you, there isn't much of a difference. Okay, so we've said already that in the case of gram-negative bacteria, there are two membranes, an inner or cytoplasmic membrane and an outer membrane Whereas in gram-positive bacteria, there is no outer membrane. So there are three cell envelope layers in gram-positive bacteria, sorry, in gram-negative bacteria, and there are two in gram-negative bacteria. And by that logic, if we think about this, we've got two membranes in gram-negative bacteria, the cell membrane and the outer membrane. Now, this is not a flat structure like I've shown it in these slides. These are spheres or, you know, other sort of three-dimensional objects and these two, these two membranes, the inner and outer membrane, are three-dimensional. So there's actually a gap in between the inner and outer membrane. They're like, they're like two bags sort of holding something between them, an inner bag and an outer bag. And that's why in gram-negative bacteria we refer to the periplasmic space. There cannot be a periplasmic space by definition in gram-positive bacteria because there is no outer membrane. So if you know there's an outer membrane, you know there's a periplasmic space and you understand why. You don't have to memorise it. Okay, so that's the differences. And, and the periplasmic space is very important because it's involved in storing degradative enzymes and it's also involved in um, uptake of substrates, food substrates from the environment. And there's more detail in the handout about this. But I think the issue I want to point out, because I think this has confused some people in the past, is that the implication is here that these store degradative enzymes, but that doesn't mean these things don't make degradative enzymes. I mean, there are bacterial toxins are often degradative enzymes that chew up membranes and carbohydrates and what have you, and we'll get into that in the pathogenesis lecture. But the issue is, is that these, just these things will secrete these things directly. They won't store them in between the inner and outer membrane because they can't. Okay? So there's more flexibility in terms of the gram-negative bacteria, but the end result is not much different. Vibria cholerae is a gram-negative organism that has a major toxin. Choler um, um, so uh, another one is, um, and that's a gram-negative organism. On the other hand, um, Clostridium perfringens is a gram-positive organism, gram-positive spore-forming organism, and it has um, uh, unique toxins that are involved in causing um, a necrosis and stopping the... Uh, and it's basically tissue destruction. So again, I'm not implying here that there are not degradative enzymes made by gram-positive po gram bacteria. We're simply saying that they can't store them very in this fashion. And this is emphasised on the next two slides. Here is again the, the gram-negative the gram cell envelope. And yes, I'm purposely showing these things over and over again in different ways because I want it to make sure that it hits home. I know you're all bright, bright people and you learn quick, but there's no point making it hard. Okay, so the gram-negative cell envelope in this case is again the cytoplasm, the inner membrane, the peptidoglycan layer. But in this case what I'm emphasising is the fact that the degradative enzymes here are actually uh, moving from here uh, through this, uh, so they're actually stored here in the periplasmic space and are actually moving to the outside when needed. And there are other things such as permeases, um, a porin is a particularly important thing because in the case of gram-negative bacteria, they've got this outer membrane sitting outside their cell membrane. Again, gram-positives don't. And, and, and I'll get into it later and some more. This membrane is not like other membranes. You'll notice these little blue things with the swiggles, which are phospholipids, are not, really not present on the outside of this membrane. This membrane is quite unique. It's very different. And this just shows you some examples of porins and lipopolysaccharides. The porins are actually involved in, in determining what can get through this outer membrane. So the outer membrane is actually the major permeability barrier, not the cell membrane in, in gram-negative bacteria. In gram-positive bacteria, they don't have an outer membrane. So things are, what gets into the cell is really determined primarily what happens at the level of the cell membrane. Okay, so 
This is quite different. This is, this, is, this is a classical thing going on in gram-negative bacteria. Now, in contrast, in gram-positive bacteria, you, know, you can see again how much simpler it looks. It has to, because this whole thing here is missing. And the processes that are involved in it are missing. And so, in this instance, yes, it has a thick wall and it has these other things, which I know you're just dying to know what they are, but we'll again talk about them later. But the issue is, is the membrane and the wall. But in this instance, the emphasis is the fact that this, the degradative enzymes get outside the wall, and that's it. They're gone. There isn't anything to keep them there. No outer membrane. Okay, so that's gram negatives and gram positives in terms of their function in uptake and secretion and permeability barriers. Well, I've whizzed through this this morning, haven't I? Okay, um, all right, so the flagella. The flagella are um, the locomotory organelles of bacteria. Again, they don't always have them. These bacteria, the flagella are what make bacteria motile. And again, they don't necessarily have flagella. There's what's referred to as tasting the environment. But the, the, not the flagella. The flagella are the locomotory organelles, but... Bacteria carry out a process called chemotaxis. And in chemotaxis, what happens is, if bacteria, let's say I'm a bacterial cell and I'm sitting over here and there's some food over there in the corner there, the bacteria will move towards the food stuff. On the other hand, if it's something nasty like phenol or alcohol or some other uh, nasty stuff, the bacteria, probably not alcohol, they probably like alcohol. But anyway, nasty sort of substances that, that would kill the bacteria they actually will tend to sort of um, move, move towards the foodstuffs and away from the noxious substances. And what happens is, is that there's a chemo, the process is referred to chemotaxis, movement towards chemicals. And what happens is, is that the, the flagella are basically turned on or off in terms of whether they'll move in terms of movement by the recognition by these sensors that recognize, the, um, recognize these, uh, na these good or nasty substances. The flagella are embedded in the cell membrane, as are the pili, which I, which I think is in the earlier figure. But anyway, there are two types of, um, of um, things that extend outside from bacterial cells. There are the flagella, which are long and are involved in motion, and the pili, which are short and are involved in adhesion. Uh, the flagella are embedded in the cell membrane and project as a strand. Now, you'll see that there actually must be lots of different proteins involved in, in a flagella because there's actually a couple of things here that look like a motor is what turns the flagella, you know, in a, in a, um, and turns it and rotates it. But this long thing that extends way out is what we're talking about is the flagella proper, and that's really what's made of flagellin. The flagellin are the protein subunits of this long arm of the flagella, and they move the cell by a propeller-like action. It's exactly what it says. These things rotate and they can be basically made to stop, rotate, or turn in the opposite direction, depending on where the back, how the bacteria is going to move. Bacteria, I should say, is going to move. Now, most, if the, the most common locomotory organelles in bacteria are indeed the flagella. A few bacterial uh, species, the trepanines and, and, and Borrelia, of course, was spirochetes, um, in particular, um, have axial filaments, and these don't work in a propeller-like motion. They're actually running longitudinally along these um, long gram-negative cells, and they actually move the cell by a snake-like motion. So these are different, and, and we only really talk about axial filaments when we're talking about spirochetes. So we'll get back to that when we talk about syphilis and uh, Lyme disease, which are two diseases caused by spirochetes. Okay, wallless bacteria. Most bacteria, we've already said, the vast bulk of bacteria have walls. They have to have walls because they, they, they need to be able to withstand, as I said, the high osmotic pressures inside the cells. Now, in the human body, things are a little different, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Things are a lot more controlled, so there's not as much need in terms of at least lysis, resisting lysis, as there is inside the human body as in the environment. So, for example, let's move through this now. You can produce wallless forms of bacteria predominantly in two ways. 
Enzymes that are lytic for the cell wall. The most common enzyme that you've probably most of you heard of before is lysozyme. Lysozyme is an en- a mammalian enzyme that will chew up the backbone of bacterial cell walls. Okay? That's one way you can get rid of the walls. The, the second way you can do it is one of the major classes of antibiotics that we're going to discuss. We're going to be dis- I'm going to be covering the cell wall uh, enzymes involved in cell wall biosynthesis, such as penicillin. And Dr. Mayer is going to be covering um, the the antibiotics that are involved in things like protein biosynthesis and nucleic acid biosynthesis, or inhibiting it, I should say. But anyway, antibiotics, one of the major sites of action of antibiotics is on stopping cell wall biosynthesis. Again, as we're going to hear later on, antibiotics recognise unique things. They're designed to deal with unique things, and bacteria have peptidoglycan, cell wall layers, we don't. And if you get rid of the peptidoglycan and you're in a high osmotic pressure, in a, in a, in a, in a um, uh, so, excuse me, if you're in a situation where the, actually the, osmotic, where the um, salt concentration is going to be low, the high osmotic pressure of the cell is going to, is going to lyse the cell. So that basically, in most situations, if you lyse the cell wall, the bacteria, the membranes lyse also, not from the action of these two things, but just from the pressure from the inside. So they're usually not viable. The key word here is usually. In contrast, um, and so what, what, and so we'll get down to here in contrast in a second. The, these wallless bacteria that don't replicate are, are two specific names. And basically, in this case, of a gram positive, a gram negative organism, you lyse the peptidoglycan, you're left with an inner and an outer membrane. And they're referred to as spheroplasts. Protoplasts are generally derived from as you, would know, as you would know by now, they must be from gram positives because by definition, there's no outer membrane in them. Okay? Now, in this instance, everything that we've set up to this point, everything we've set up to this point, we've talked about taking regular bacteria that are, have got all the capability, all the machinery to make cell walls, and we've done something to them to, make, to get rid of their walls. We're going to contrast that in, this, in the next slide. Now, everything we've said here, these don't replicate. Well, sometimes you get unlucky. For example, in gonorrhea, sometimes in streptococcal infections, you get unlucky and you treat with an enzyme that inhibits the cell wall biosynthesis. And as I've said already, the, the osmotic pressure is a lot more controlled in, in the human body and some of these organisms have adapted to it and they produce things called L-forms. So the, only, the difference with an L-form is that once you've gone through this process of getting rid of the wall, if the bacteria will replicate in the human body, then by, by definition it's referred to as an L form. Okay, so that's the only thing that makes this, this, this is, all this stuff is still referring to L forms. The issue is, is whether they can replicate or not. Okay, so spiroplasts and protoplasts would not replicate, but L forms would. And they're not that common, but they do happen. Now, this, you must, don't get confused what I just said just now. Now, I haven't got into to taxonomy yet. We are going to have a whole lecture on that next. But by definition, when you see some horrible Latin name, like mycoplasma, which you can oftentimes barely pronounce the first time you hear it, that is a species, or sorry, a genus name, as you'll hear about shortly. That's a, that means that this is naturally wallless. It's not that we've added antibiotics or, or, um, or lysozyme or done anything to it. These things don't make walls, period. Okay, and I think it will be probably mentioned later on in the chlamydia lecture. The chlamydia um, do not have a, appear to have a peptidoglycan. They, they they probably have a wall, but they don't have a peptidoglycan. But anyway, for this moment, let's focus on the mycoplasmas, and, and don't get confused with mycoplasma and mycobacteria, which often students in this class have. Just because names sound alike doesn't mean they got anything to do with each other. Mycoplasma is a gram-negative organism. Mycobacteria are acid-fast bacteria that cause tuberculosis. They've got nothing to do with each other. In fact, the cell walls, as you'll hear later on, in mycobacteria are very unusual, but it's got nothing to do with mycoplasma. So this is mycoplasma here. I mentioned already the flagella as the, being the, one of the organelles that extends out from the cell membrane. Now, they're very long, and I have a slide which I think came up with somewhere for the last time last year, which I'll show you in a later lecture. 
Um, but anyway, it's very, they're very different, the pili and the fimbriae. The flagella are usually say, very long and very obvious. The pili are short and usually quite thin. What they have in, um, what they ha- the only thing they really have in common is they both extend out from the cell. Um, but they have nothing to do with each other in terms of what they do. The pili are often involved in, sort of, they're really involved in attachment, bringing things together. So they can be involved in transfer of uh, DNA between two cells in rep- or they can be involved in adhesion to the host epithelium. Pili are very important in bacterial pathogenesis because they're, they are on the outside. Okay? So just because pili and flagella are both appendages that extend out from the cell membrane, they have, they, they have nothing to do with each other in terms of function or structure. Okay? Finally, I want to talk about, well, actually two things, about capsules and then spores. All right, now capsules, they're sometimes referred to as slime layers. Capsules are, are usually carbohydrate. They're, again, they're not part of the cell wall proper. They are usually carbohydrates that are secreted by the cell and form this sort of a muck or goo around the outside of the cell. When they form a sort of a very a clear, sort of large, huge, huge um, external commission of this stuff, it's sometimes referred to as a slime layer or sometimes as a glycocalyx. But I would say the most common term is certainly capsule. Again, it's outside the cell envelope. It's well defined. The capsule, not so well defined, it can be a slime layer or glycocalyx, but these terms are really used very much interchangeably. The big deal is they're usually polysaccharide, and that wouldn't be so. That, I mean, we, in the past, we might have, when we really would say almost always polysaccharide, but when you'll get to Bacillus anthracis, you'll learn that the capsule in Bacillus anthracis is actually a polydeglutamic acid capsule, which is one of the two major pathogenesis factors. So that's why it says usually, almost always. If you, with the exception of Bacillus anthracis, you're almost never going to hear about a capsule being made of anything other than a polysaccharide. I've already mentioned that it's often lost in in vitro culture. And the reason is because the capsule is what's involved in stopping cells being taken up or killed by polymorph nuclear cells and macrophages. Well, if you've got them and throwing them on a plate or in liquid in the, in the laboratory, you don't need a capsule. They're perfectly happy if they're, you know, they're, warm, they're, they're warm and comfortable and there's lots of food around. They're happy. And they don't produce capsules often in this situation. They lose their capsules. The capsules are, again, something we think about very much as involved in pathogenesis. They can be very important in terms of environmental organisms because they often is what pull groups of organisms together and have, have them live in sort of colonies of, uh, sort of, so that these, in, these uh, organisms can interact. But basically in the, in, in, in the human body, um, capsules is where we particularly think of them about. They are, again, protective for the reasons that I've just given. And we'll get more into capsules in the pathogenesis. But again, right throughout this course, we'll mention capsules quite a bit, actually. Um, the final thing I want to talk about in this lecture is the endospore, or spore. Usually we use the word spores, but they are endospores. They are, unlike in certain other organisms, spores or the dormant forms of bacteria are produced within the cell. That's why they're referred to as endo. We're going to have a... We're going to have a um, in the cell wall lecture, I'm going to have a few pictures and diagrams about making the differences between spores and the contrast term to this is vegetative. Spores meaning dormant, vegetative is um, a fast-growing or normal form of the cell. Now, you don't usually use this word vegetative, which I will mention later, because basically the simple thing is the vast bulk of bacteria don't make spores. So when you're talking about things like E. coli or Shigella or Salmonella or Mycobacteria, they don't make spores. So you don't care. You don't say, well, this one's a fast growing, this is slow. There is no fast growing or slow growing form. There's no, there's no spores, period. The spores change everything in terms of how you talk about things. And so when we talk about spore forming organisms, we'll talk about them quite differently. They are the dormant form of the cell. They are produced when the cell is starved and they are resistant to adverse conditions. They are extremely resistant. Uh, we'll get, and the point is, and they're also very unique, the only place in nature that, that you find large concentrations of calcium dipicolinate is within the sport bacterial spores. And it's involved, presumably, in, uh, in the resistance of these organisms to heat and dehydration. Bacillus and Clostridium. Now, if you see this word again, bacillus, we use the word bacillus um, in different ways. Sometimes you'll see the word bacillus. This is capitalised and italicised. 
And we'll talk about that in the next lecture, what that, why. That's a taxonomic term. If it's, if it's capitalized and italicized, that means it's a, that's a genus name. If we didn't have a capital there, and if, for example, it was bacilli, the plural of bacillus, that would be a generic term simply stating something is rod-shaped. And we'll get into that next lecture. But the issue is this. These are only two major genera among pathogenic bacteria that make true spores, which are the bacillus, bacillus and clostridium. So again, we don't make a big fuss about spores most of the time because we're not discussing the only matters when we're talking about these two groups of organisms. Okay, I'll get, you, we'll get some more stuff on that. The next lecture is going to be on, now we're going to get past the generalities and we're going to start to begin to focus on how we know what an organism in the clinical laboratory and how we use this in treating infectious diseases. Okay, thank you.